Thanks, Marguerite. Uh, just you mentioned Art Phillips, 1972, was it? 1973. 1973 uh, inaugural address. If if you really want to see the mark of a really outstanding mayor, read that document. It's unbelievable. He laid everything out that he was going to do in his term. Who would do it? All the details, like a business and plan. And then he did it. And he did it all. And he was only there for four years. It was incredible. quite remarkable how he transformed the city. Starting with that plan, all thought out before he sat down in this first meeting. Well, I'm just going to throw a few kind of anecdotes out there. Um, I'm not going to be quite as systematic as Marguerite, and no doubt Francis will be. Um, I want to just <laughs> she makes up her notes here. Uh, I want to I want to start with just a, my personal experience as a member of council during the hiring of Brent Totter, the previous planner, to Brian Jackson. And just to give an idea of the real politics of it, and I remember being called into the city manager's office one day, and we were told we knew that planning that Larry Beasley had leave, was leaving or had left, and we needed a new planner. And uh, in camera meeting, we were just told, kind of told, we got somebody. Uh, we got this great guy. You're going to love him, and um, we don't really have anybody else. Uh, there's a few other people, but they weren't really. So it's basically a take it or leave it kind of thing. To this day, I don't know who made that choice, whether and how much the mayor was consulted. Probably had another meeting earlier than the one with the council. But we just really didn't have much say. I think Larry Beasley had a lot to do with it. I think the city manager had a lot to do with it. And uh, who knows who else. And then right after we approved the person, I started getting these phone calls. Do you know what you guys did? Do you know who this guy is? Do you know how hated he was in Calgary by all the development community? <laughs> No, I didn't know that. And so I was calling Calgary, what's going on? And then I finally came to the conclusion that he was probably hated to the extent that he was because he stuck up for principles of city planning ahead of the interests of the developers who weren't used to that. So I took that as an okay sign. But there were almost emergency meetings at UDI about how do we get rid of this guy, how can we stop him from coming in here. So that's one of the realities of the city planner. I'm going to go just to, through a few things that the city planner has to deal with, the director of planner planning. Uh, and one is pressure from developers who uh, provide financial pressure. They finance city politicians, basically, pretty much entirely. Um, there is political pressure that they apply, they lobby heavily, they have people, some of them may even be in this room, who are expert at lobbying council behind the scenes. And they also have a, a kind of a compelling presence because they have expertise. They, they know what it costs to build these things. They know the reality of trying to do different things that the city might want done, but they know it can or cannot be done. Um, city planner health has to deal with all the past plans, and I went through just a few. There are so many. And uh, City Plan was just sort of the grandmother of them all from 1995, which was done, uh, I think it was Gordon Campbell who originally said, let's get this thing going, get the citizens to come up with these ideas. I printed out a few of the highlights. It goes on for a few pages, but it was only supposed to work for 20 years, so it's gone. It's out of date, but it's still hovering in the background. Then there are all these neighborhood plans. There's the bird. Uh, accommodation plan, there's the green roof plan, there's the laneway housing plan. It's a miracle that anybody could come to some sense with all this sometimes overlapping and conflicting plans. The city planner has to work also to think about the city's revenues. The city has become increasingly dependent on community amenity contributions, development costs, charges, to finance all kinds of infrastructure and things. And unfortunately, that is a factor in decision making and planning. The, the planner has to protect the public interest, but the question becomes, which public? The ones who show up and make a noise at council meetings, or at neighborhood participation meetings, or the ones who sign on to play speak and participate in online polling, the ones who have um, actually ideas that we're just sorry we're not going to listen to. I don't want that social housing in my neighborhood. I don't care what you say. And they can show up 90% at the public meeting, and we just go ahead and say, we're having it anyway, because it's a council policy. The person has to be good at listening and reaching out. Uh, as Marguerite said, a great communicator, being able to go to the neighborhoods, listen, explain, show how the ideas are going to fit into their neighborhood. Um, has to deal with the regional perspective, because we are part of a larger region, which 
forces us, or we've agreed, to take on so many people in the growth of the region, and there's no stopping those people coming here. So we have to somehow, uh, the planner has to find a way to fit them into existing neighborhoods now. We can no longer fit them into industrial areas because they're kind of used up. On that note, I think the planner also has to be looking at the job space of, of the region and saying, uh, we have to protect those industrial areas. There is no constituency for those industrial areas except a few business lobbyists, but they are vital to the health of the city. And we are constantly eroding them. Every time I see a new building, we have industrial area, I go, there we go. The residential folks have had their way, and we've got one more uh, car repair place or, or parking lot or, or bus depot has to be pushed out of town or to the edge of town to the detriment of the city. Um, the planner has to be a bit of a dreamer and designer. Um, planners were credited with the, sort of the dream of the, the seawall that goes all around the uh, waterfront of the city, which is one of the great triumphs of planning in the city. Um, and they have to be constant negotiators, and, and Marguerite talked, to the, talked about this. Um, because I see so many people here who know so much more about this than I do, I'm going to just close with this and just uh, say a comment that somebody made about Larry Beasley, who was the consummate negotiator. And uh, no matter whether he was negotiating with council to accept his ideas, or with the neighborhood, or with, go with, with, with uh, developers, it's been said that when, when Larry was negotiating with, it, with you, you felt like he was making love with you. And when he finished, <laughs> when he finished you realized you'd been screwed. <laughs> That's the mark of a great plan. <laughs>